Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, you alone are worthy. We have come to give you our adoration and praise. We will give you all the glory. You will reign forever. You are Christ the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Well, once again, if you uh, happen to come in in the last few minutes, we're, we're glad you're here. A special welcome to you. If this is not your church home, if you're visiting from out of town or just found your way to visit with us, we're glad that you're with us. And to those watching online as well, we're glad you're with us. If you've been part of Chapel Street Church, you know that we talk about our Serve the World partners in the Advent season. Serve the World is the way we talk about our ability to make a difference to collectively greater than we ever could individually outside of our walls. We pick partners every year, local and global, gospel-centered ministry partners to, be, to pray for and to be generous toward. And usually we tell you some of their stories. The last couple of weeks, if you've been here, we've told you the story of Serve the World, how it's bigger than just one project. There are many partners doing remarkable ministry. This morning, we want to tell you one story of one life changed from one partner. This is Becky's story. Let's watch this together. When you ask how trafficking became a part of my life, its tentacles was digging deep into my life before I even realized what it was. There was nothing ingrained in me in my childhood for you're better than this or you're worthy. I never really knew about the worth of God and how God feels about his daughters. The way I understood sex as a teenager and as a young person is there's not a deeper meaning to it. We're just seeking outside of ourselves to fill a void. I had lost my virginity to a man who was much older than me, and then I started using drugs shortly thereafter, and it was my family's drugs. That was my crutch to use drugs for so long. It made me a target for traffickers. I was easily accessible. I had no self-worth. I had not a shred of self-esteem at all. It took me a long time to get to the point to where I was done, and then eventually I got arrested. I was one of the hopeless varieties that a lot of people said they probably would never get out, and I did. I see somebody who was in a lot of pain. What would you say to that girl now? I don't know. I would tell her there's hope. I went into a treatment facility on my own. And then shortly after, while I was in a program in downtown Chicago, I went into Naomi's house. Naomi's house is just so comfortable. It was definitely like a home that I had always dreamed of that never thought that I would have. Every woman in there just showed so much grace and was so welcoming. What I'd come from was complete hate constantly having to watch my back and I come into this house of women who just want to build me up and I can tell they're walking with the Lord. It showed me a way that was so foreign to me but was what God wanted from me all along. I would say when I came to Naomi's house my relationship with him got really strong. There's devotions in the morning. Every woman in there, the shift supervisors, have all been instrumental in my journey with Christ. I went back to school while I was still in Naomi's house. I was able to accumulate 22 credits while I was there. I got my certified recovery support specialist certificate. I was a case aide basically hung out with the clients and just like took them to lunch and dinner and I'm able to be an advocate for some of them. The way it makes me feel when I'm able to help other women is the most immense amount of joy I have ever felt. And I believe that I went through everything I went through so that I can come back and help people that are just like me. And because of Naomi's house, I get the opportunity to do that every day. How have I seen God working in my story? <laughs> Whew. God, he's so good. 
He's all over my story. He's everywhere. My whole story has just been tailor fit better than I could have ever imagined. That's been my whole like experience since I decided to surrender to him. Okay. Oh, okay. I got it. All right. The year of the Lord's favor, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from the darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our Lord, to comfort all who mourn and provide to those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Yeah, <laughs> it's okay to applaud for that. <clears throat> Every time I've seen it a dozen times already and um, only God does that, her story. What a privilege it is for us. We don't always get to hear, you don't always see the impact of your generosity and contribution to the work of God, but it's a privilege for us to tell you a couple of stories to remind you that God's at work in ways you don't see. And in the lives of people you may never meet this side of heaven, uh, but Becky's one of them. And uh, if you are a believer in Jesus, she's your sister in Christ. I love what she said, all, all that she'd been through, it was better than she could have ever imagined once she decided to surrender to Jesus. How awesome is, is our God? Let's pray. God, we thank you for your kindness and generosity and grace in our lives. We're not worthy of it. We don't deserve it. And all of us, if we see our lives accurately, are without hope until we find you or you find us. Thank you for coming into our world, for redeeming us and for loving us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I should have mentioned, but uh, we're, we're um, in case you're wondering how you can be part of that. We're trying to raise $300,000 uh, through Advent to give to our Serve the World partners in the new year. Naomi's house is one of them. We'll tell you another story next week. But if you uh, have the, if God has get blessed you and you have the resources, we encourage you to consider giving above and beyond to, to, to serve the world, to make that difference. Um, if you've been with us, you know we're in our series called Light and Life, uh, looking at John's prologue to his gospel. The first 14 verses of John's gospel where he sort of sets the stage for who is Jesus, really, and what does his life, death, resurrection mean? What's it all about? What's the purpose of it? We've been looking at it. It's really an amazing 14 verses. We've been spending the last two now, uh, two more weeks on these 14 verses. As Jesus puts it himself in John 18, he says, For this purpose I was born. For this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to my voice. So I pray that we would listen to his voice this morning as we hear from John chapter 1. Let's stand together as I read from John 1, verses 1 through 14. John chapter 1, this is God's word. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is God's word. You may be seated. Now we've looked at these themes in those 14 verses. Three, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, the first theme was the word. In the beginning was the word, the capital W, the word logos in Greek, the first principle that undergirds all of creation, all of the universe. It's not a philosophy you follow or a set of beliefs you ascribe to. It's a person you surrender to and have a relationship with, the man Jesus. He's the logos, the word. 
Last week, we looked at the light, the theme of the light. Light and darkness is all over the Christmas season in our culture. It's all over the story of Advent in the Bible. The light shining in the darkness and the unique role of John the Baptist who came to bear witness about the light. And in a sense, our lives who follow Jesus are like his life. We are, are there to believe in Christ as the light, the light of the world, and to bear witness about him, to point to him. Today we come to this word life. Jesus as the, our life, the life. In John 14, verse six, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So whatever the life is, it's somehow connected to or bound up in, in him, in Jesus. You might have missed this, but in John 1, verse 4, we read right through it. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. I want you to notice this word here. That he, simply, we, it's just English word, life. But this, uh, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. This is the, the Greek word, zoe. It's a unique word. All of the New Testament, or most of it anyway, was written in ancient Greek, some in Aramaic, but mostly Greek. And John is a master of the, of the Greek language. He, there's three major words he could have chosen from to describe life uh, in, in his description of what he's talking about here. You'll see them here on the screen. The first one, bios, physical life. Biology comes from this word. Uh, study of biology, physical life, material life, life on, on planet Earth, as it were. Uh, suke, psychological, uh, intellectual, mind, will, soul life. That part of you that's not physical. The, the psychological and spiritual soul part of you. And then this word zoe. In John's vocabulary, in his gospel, this is a unique word. Uh, it encompasses the previous two, but it's bigger than that. It's more than just your mind, will, spirit, and your biology. It's the life that God intends for you. The eternal life divine life that only he can give. It's used 135 times in the New Testament and almost always around the idea of, the, of eternal life, life of God, the life that is found in Christ. In John chapter 10, Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. And he says there's a hired hand who don't really care for the sheep. There's the thief who comes to attack the sheep. And then there's the good shepherd who comes for a different purpose. In verse 10, here's how he puts it. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life, Zoe, and have it abundantly. Now this, this connection of life and abundant, I want to talk about this for just a minute. So this idea of life abundantly. What, what does it mean to have life abundantly? Like in our culture, we might say it, the good life, to live the good life, to have a good life, a full life, uh, a blessed life, hashtag blessed, we put on our Instagram post, right? What does that mean in our culture? What do people mean when they talk about a blessed, full, abundant life? Most often, they, they connect that idea with stuff, with wealth, with possessions, with material um, acc um, acquiring of things. That's, that, that enables you to live the good life the more you have. You may not know this, but there was a new record set in Major League Baseball for the largest contract in the history of, of MLB. Anybody know who that is? Japanese player named Shohei Otani. You'll see a picture of him here on the screen. He's on the left, obviously. He's a pitcher, and a, it's unique to pitch and bat, but he's uniquely talented. $700 million over the next 10 years uh, is his contract with the Los Angeles Dodgers. That's crazy amount of money. Abundant life. This, I don't know who this woman is in the middle, but apparently she's famous. I, I refuse to speak her name out loud. Anyway, uh, she apparently, uh, uh, did a little math online, can earn $700 million, not in 10 years, but in one year. Abundant life. You know who the guy on the right is? Elon Musk. Net worth $254 billion. He could earn $700 million in a day just off the interest of his wealth. Think about that. Who has the more abundant life? How do we measure what's an abundant life? Which life would you choose, given the choice? How do you measure it? Now, it won't surprise you. You're in church. It won't shock you to know that when Jesus talks about abundant life, he's not talking about mega millions. There, there, are, there are pastors and Christian leaders today who will tell you this different. They'll tell you that the good life, the abundant life from John 10, 10, is Jesus coming in to heal all your diseases, make your life comfortable, happy, and ex extraordinarily wealthy. So that's what blessed life is. That's what a good life is. The problem with that is, first of all, it's not in the Bible. That's the number one problem. Second is the 12 disciples who followed Jesus, like his closest followers, they, they somehow missed out on that promise. 
They all died poor and homeless and terrible deaths, but we get the millions. That doesn't make any sense. Obviously, he's talking about something different than how our culture would measure or take stock of what abundant life means. First thing I want you to see from John 1 is new life means new birth. This life Jesus offers to us, abundant life, zoe, full life, exalted life, life in Christ, requires a new birth. New birth? Yes, new birth. We sing it in the, in the hymn. We go to that hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. One more slide there. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings. There's our series title. Look at down there. Born that man no more may die. Born to raise the sons of earth. Born to give them what? Second birth. How many of you, when you sing that song, think about that phrase? Born to give you and me, who have faith in Christ, second birth. It's amazing. Glory to the newborn king. Well, where did, where did Charles Wesley get that idea? He wrote that hymn, by the way. He wrote 7,000 hymns. That guy was crazy. Uh, but anyway, uh, in the best possible way. He got the idea from John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13. John puts it this way. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. He gave them the right to become something new, a new child Born not of blood or of will of the flesh or will of man, meaning not born the way you were the first time. When you came into this world the first time. But born of God. A different kind of birth. A new birth. A second birth. What Christians call being born again. Now let's be honest for a minute. When most of us hear the phrase born again, what do you think of? What, well, maybe a better question is, what do you think most folks in our culture think of when they hear the term born again Christian? Is it positive? They think, oh, the, the particular type, those born-again types, those overzealous, self-righteous, crazy, over-the-top, morally upright, holier-than-thou, born-again types. I saw this bumper sticker on a car uh, <laughs> uh, not long ago. My wife and I, a couple years ago, were driving, and it said, born again, born okay the first time. <laughs> I, in fact, I had a conversation with a guy once who said, I am a Christian, I believe in Jesus, I mean, I'm not the born-again kind, once was enough for me. This exact phrase. What, what, what do you think is behind, what's the sentiment behind this, this, this image? There's a bit of an offense, right? What do you mean born again? I'm fine. I mean, I, I believe in God intellectually. I'm a good, or I'm a good person. I do good in the world. I'm, I don't kill anybody. I'm not running around on my wife or my husband. I mean, I'm pretty generous. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. What do you mean born again? The implication of being born again is that there's something not okay with you. You need a new life. But the life you have isn't going to cut it. Something has to happen. The Bible describes it as being born again. New birth. This is the point John makes in, in verse 10. He says the world did not know him. In verse 11, his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him and believed in his name. The point here is that it, it, there's only one type of Christian. The born again type. According to the scriptures, there's, you cannot be a follower of Jesus unless this has happened to you. Unless you've been born again. There's no middle ground on this one. The gospel insists the only way to become God's child is when you receive a new life by new birth through faith in Jesus Christ. Nowhere in the Bible, I think, is this more clearly uh, outlined than in this remarkable little uh, interaction Jesus has with a guy named Nicodemus. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus is a, a Pharisee, a wealthy, respected man in the culture, and he comes to Jesus at night. So I like to refer to this story as Nick at night. He comes to Jesus late at night, and he has this conversation, or he wants to have a conversation about the kingdom of God, because he recognizes there's something about this Jesus guy that I need to understand. And he's a highly educated religious man. Here's part of the story, John chapter three, verses one through six. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. You've probably heard about Pharisees, right? Pharisees are those, those, that group that Jesus often has conflict with, but they're not all bad. They're serious, really serious about studying and keeping the law of God. He was a ruler of the Jews. That means he was of the high council. So he's educated, seriously religious, and has a high position in the, in the culture. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who comes from God, for no one can do these signs unless God is with him. Doesn't it sound like he's sort of uh, moving toward his question? 
We know that you're from God. And so here's, but he doesn't get to his question. Before he can even ask it, Jesus smacks him with this statement. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This, this is like a shocker. Nicodemus is morally upright, religious, respected, wealthy, high position. And Jesus says, we can't even have this conversation, Nick, until you're born again. We can't talk kingdom. And by the way, kingdom is, the kingdom life is a theme in John's gospel. It's what he means by life abundant. Life in Christ. Nicodemus was far more religious than you are. Far more serious about obeying God than you are, than most of us are. Highly educated, highly respected. And Jesus says, you need a do-over. You need a whole new life. Whoa. Whoa. What does that mean? Well, in part, that means it doesn't matter your education. It doesn't matter your parents. It doesn't matter how respected you are. It doesn't matter your pedigree. You must be born again. Flip it around. It doesn't matter how bad you've been. It doesn't matter how abused you've been. Think of Becky's story. It doesn't matter what's been done to you. It doesn't matter how much shame. It doesn't matter how much darkness or brokenness. You can be born again. To those who think Jesus is like an additive to my life. I'm pretty good. I'm not perfect. I would never say that. But I'm doing pretty good. I just need a little something. I can tell this story all the time. Years ago, I was coaching football with my little kids football. And this guy on my son's team I was coaching said, oh, I found out I was a pastor. Oh, I could use a little Jesus in my life. I said, oh, well, he wants to be in your life, but he's not little. There's no such thing as a little Jesus in your life. Oh, oh, thank you, Jesus. I'll put it in my pocket, you know. He, He wants to come in your life and make you new give you a new birth. For those that think he's like an add-on, you must be born again. For those who think you're not worthy and can never measure up, you can be born again. That's the message that John says to those who receive and believe in him. He gives this right. C.S. Lewis puts it this way in Mere Christianity. Uh, I, it's a little bit long, but it's, it's, he's got some great insight for us here. And now we begin to see what it is the New Testament is always talking about. It talks about Christians being born again. It talks about them putting on Christ, about Christ being formed in us. Put right out of your head the idea that these are only fancy ways of saying that Christians are to read what Christ said and try to carry it out. As a man may read what Plato or Marx said and try to carry it out. Let me pause there. Hear what he's saying? Being born again has nothing to do with your effort. Nothing to do with you. Oh, okay, Jesus, I get it. Be a good person. Have faith. Okay, okay. I'll try hard to live this new life that you've laid out for me by your teachings. That's not new life. That's death, actually. You could never do it on your own. It's not about you. Put that out of your head, Lewis says. He goes on. They mean something much more than that. They mean that a real person, Christ, here and now, in the very room where you're saying your prayers, is doing things to you, killing the old natural self in you, and replacing it with the kind of self that he has, at first only for moments, then for longer periods. Finally, turning you permanently into a different sort of thing altogether, into a new little Christ, a being which is in its own small way has the same kind of life as God, which shares in his power, joy, knowledge, and eternity. Now, if you're uncomfortable with him calling you a little Christ, he doesn't mean you become the savior of your own life. He means the life of Jesus Christ, his knowledge, power, joy, flows into your life when you're born again. You have in you the life that he has in him. This is why the Apostle Paul always uses this phrase, in Christ, in Christ, in him. This new life is something he's doing in you. You can participate in it, receive it, join in it, or reject it, dismiss it, and resist it. But he does it. This is what John means when he says that we are given the right to become children of God. It's given to us. He gave you this right. It's a gift that you receive by grace, not something you earn or achieve. I have struggled with this a lot most of my life. Having played football and wrestling when I was younger and growing up in college, I always, everything was about achievement. Conquering, winning, beating the opponent, measuring up, being the best. Well, that, that has some good, pays some good dividends in, in a man's life. But it, gets, it got in the way of my soul for many, many years. You don't earn this life. You don't grab it for yourself. You don't wrestle it to the ground and make it yours. You get on your knees and receive it. It's given to you if you will receive. 
Now, some of you might object, wait a minute, aren't we all children of God? I mean, isn't everyone made in his image? Aren't we all his children? Well, in a sense, of course, we're all created by God. We are all, as Paul says in Acts 17, his offspring made in his image. But John is saying, when you are born again, something very unique happens, utterly different happens. You enter into a new identity, a new relationship, and a new life that is not possible otherwise. This is where the idea of abundance comes in, the abundant life. I want to just briefly share you with, with you three eyes. I'll write them on the screen here. Three eyes that sort of outline what the abundant life really is. The first one is identity. When you trust in Jesus Christ, you have a new identity. You're born again. You're, you have a new family name. You're his child. The, the New Testament, particularly Romans, uses the language of adoption. You're brought into a new family, a new citizenship, a new name, a new identity. The second I is intimacy. You have a new relationship with God the Father, an intimate relationship with him. He's no longer the angry stepfather in the sky or some guy that's gonna get you if you step out of line or someone you don't know. You know him intimately. You call him father. And the third I is inheritance. These three eyes, identity, intimacy, and inheritance, describe this, this new life, this abundant life. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 through 17. Here's what he says. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. Now, earlier in the, in the chapter, he says, we have the spirit of adoption by which we call out to God and call him Father. We are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, in order that we may also be glorified with him. His life becomes our life. In other words, we're in him. This is an incredible description here. New relationship with God, your father. Like um, I, I read a book about, the, about Abraham Lincoln's wartime cabinet uh, during the Civil War and how they'd be meeting and little Tad Lincoln would run in to these meetings with all the generals and his cabinet members and Tad would interrupt and run right up into his dad's lap. And some of these, uh, these um, cabinet members of government officials were, were annoyed by this but it was his son, so he had those rights. He could run to his daddy's lap. Like, if you, if you ran into the White House today and tried to run across the White House lawn and get right into the Oval Office, you'd probably be arrested, maybe even shot, right? You, you don't have that access. You can't do that. I mean, it'd be weird if you want to go jump on President Biden's lap, but anyway. <laughs> but you can't do it. You, you, don't have, you don't have that relationship. You don't have that access. But if you're the president's daughter, if you're the president's son, you can come right in different access. That's what Paul is saying here and what John is saying. He gave you the right to become God's child, new access, new identity, new family, new intimacy. He's your father. Doesn't every fairy tale, like, you know, the adopted, the orphan, well, my true, they, 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 sort of the fantasy in the orphan's mind is my true father, my real father is a great king, wealthy Lord. He someday is going to come for me. Well, that fantasy of the orphan in the fairy tales is the reality of the gospel. Those who are born again, he is your father. He is king of kings. He has come for you in Christ if you receive him. This is the reality of the gospel. First Peter chapter one puts it this way. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has what? Read this with me. Caused us to be born again to a living hope to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. There it is. That's yours in Christ. He gives you the right to become his child with all the status, all the privileges, all the access, yours in Christ. It's 100% secure. Every other identity in this life is fragile. It's insecure. I told you a moment ago that I was, played a lot of sports in high school and in college, and I built my identity on that. Well, when I finally played my last uh, football game in a brief stint out of college, my old high school coach talked to me and he said, Jeffrey, you've now joined the largest fraternity in all of sports, those who used to play. <laughs> it all comes to an end. It all comes to an end. It's over. Now who am I? You build it on your career. I've talked to so many men in our church over the years who they believe in God, they go to church, they're moral, but their identity, their sense of security and identity in this world is their career. And then there's a corporate takeover or a downsizing, and it's gone. 
rug pulled out. Now who are you? Even your family. God forbid anything happens, right? The point of the gospel is when you are born again, your sense of security and who you are in this world is in Christ and it cannot be taken. It cannot be taken. It's in him. It's rock solid, 100% secure. This is, what, this is how Timothy Keller, I came across this quote late in my preparation, but it's really good. I love this image he gives us about how this works in us, this new birth power. Where is the new birth from? That's an interesting question, isn't it? It's from the future. The new birth is the power that God is going to use to generate, regenerate the world, brought into your present. It's not complete, of course. It's only partial. But didn't you always like time travel stories? I, I have. I love time travel stories. I love getting into some time machine or something and going to the future. Well, this is kind of like that, only it's the reverse. It's the future coming into you. It's God's future present in your heart now. It's that renewing, regenerating power by which God is going to heal everything and remove all evil and all sin. But it comes into your heart now. Only partially, but actually. And that's what it means to be born again. I love that image. We say often, or I have said often, that as a Christian, it's not my present that determines my future. It's the future certainty of Christ that determines how I live in my present. This is what Keller is saying. To be born again means that power which God will one day bring in its fullness to restore everything is present in your heart now through Christ. To do something in you that would not otherwise be possible. Okay, but how? How does this happen? How does it happen to someone like Becky's story? How is it possible that someone in such a broken state could be so full of joy and hope? Last, new life requires believing and receiving. There's a lot contained in these two words. You'll see them here in John 1, verse 12. But to all who did receive him, this is a Greek word, lambano, who believed in his name, this is the same word for faith. By the way, this, this word lambano, uh, earlier in John's gospel, he says the, darkness, the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. That's the word katalambano, not believing, not receiving, rejecting, holding at a distance. Who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What does it mean to receive and to believe? Well, to receive, the word means to take in, to grab hold of, and to welcome. Let's talk for a minute about when Jesus comes into the world, who is he? How does he come? I mean, as an infant, of course, we know that in the Christmas story, but what, what are his roles, titles, functions? Well, he comes as Savior. Receive, welcome, take hold of his salvation. He, he comes as teacher. Receive and welcome his instruction in your life. He comes as king. Receive his authority over your life. He comes as provider. Welcome his provision for your life. Trust him fully. He comes as judge. Receive and welcome the judgment that he brings over all of life. Now here's, I think most of us would like to think we can pick and choose how we will receive him. And honestly, as your pastor, this is my greatest concern for us in the comfortable suburban church life. We convince ourselves that I will receive his forgiveness and grace and mercy. I will receive his provision for my life. But I will hold at arm's length his lordship, his kingship, his authority, his instruction. You can't do it. You can't be received that way. You are deceiving yourself, if that's you. You welcome him and receive him for all that he is, or not at all. You take Jesus, as he's presented to you, Lord, King, Ruler, Savior. Yes, healer, forgiver, provider, but everything else too. And you place your life in his hands. I don't think the danger for most of you, most of us, is that we're going to just reject him outright. I mean, that happens. John tells us his own people did not receive him. Some people then and still today dismiss him out of hand, not interested. But my observation is for most of us, we convince ourselves that I can receive him on my terms. 
I can pick and choose what parts I will receive. And you cannot. That is the same as to reject him. But the great news is, to all who do receive him, who welcome him as he's presented to you, he gives the right to become his son, his daughter. Do you remember when Becky said, I have no idea how God thinks of his daughters. And now she does. How'd that happen? She tells you, she told you in the video, she said, it's better than I ever imagined once I surrendered to him. Did you catch that phrase? Once I surrendered myself to him. That's what it means to receive and to believe in his name. Believing in his name, believing in his name does not just mean I believe that he existed historically. It doesn't even mean that you believe intellectually that the incarnation and the resurrection are real. It, meaning you could actually believe that God became a man and that he rose from the grave and not yet have placed your life in his hands. Received what he's offering. It's placing your trust in him. Later in his life, John, the author of this gospel, wrote a series of letters. First, second, and third John, we call them. In first John, here's what he writes. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Could it be clearer? I write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know you have eternal life. In the words of my good Australian mate, John Dixon, the gospel tells a story and inside that story are two other stories. A story of tragic rejection and glorious acceptance. It was true in, in John's prologue. It's true today. But the gospel story is an incredible offer being made to the world of life in the name of Jesus. They could have had no other way. The best possible life which extends into all eternity. New identity, new intimacy, new access, new inheritance that outshines any of the people I could put on the screen and their net worth, that's yours in Christ. And some reject. Tragically, will not receive. But it's also a story of glorious, marvelous acceptance. John says it. To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gives, and still gives today, the right to become children of God. I think it's possible to be in church all your life and not truly be a child of God and have life in Christ. What a tragedy. I know some of you, that describes you. You believe from a distance, but you've not received. Let's pray together. Father God, we confess and acknowledge that we have no life apart from you. There is no life outside of you. It's a mist, a vapor, it's here one day and gone the next. It's all fragile, all fleeting, and none of it amounts to anything apart from you. But in you, we have it all. For those of us who have received and do believe in your name, Lord, remind us again of the incredible joy and beauty and power of what it is you have done, who you are. And if you're here this morning and you have not received, I invite you to pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, I recognize that my, I have no hope in my life without you. And so I welcome and receive you, all of who you are, king, ruler, master, savior, healer, provider, all of it, Lord. I want all of who you are and all of the life that you offer. I place my life in your hands. Surrender myself to you. Lord Jesus, you are our life. We pray these things in your name and for your sake and glory. Amen. You know, uh, if, you, if you prayed, I'm going to go with me. If you prayed to receive and believe in his name, then you can sing that I know it's true. You are who he says you are, not who the world or anyone else says. And in fact, if that's true about you, tell somebody. Come tell me. Members of our prayer team are available in the glass room. We'd love to pray with you and encourage you. Tell a friend who you know loves Jesus. Tell somebody. They want to encourage you in your, your walk in Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, on this last Sunday before Christmas, go in the mercy, grace, love, and the life that is found in Jesus. 
his name be glorified now and forever. Amen. Go in peace.